Hello and welcome to Garrock Farms. In today's video, we are gonna go over the milking system here in the dairy barn. It's gonna be a bit of an educational video. We've had videos in the past where we've gone over the milking units and the, the wash cycle and, and the tank and things like that and some of our somatic cell and the numbers behind that, but we've never really showed you the, the heart behind getting the milk to the bulk tank and then eventually where it gets to you guys, the consumer. So we wanted to show you the equipment in the dairy facility, in the dairy barn, that actually helps us get the milk to the, the bulk tank, to the milk house. So what we'll do is we'll explain how the system works. So, cause I know there's, you, you farmers have done this. You, I'm not gonna get all the terms exact. We'll walk you through how a milking machine pipeline in a stanchion barn works, you know, and there's, there's parlor setups there's robot setups. Generally what's going on is the same thing. It's just shaped different. And so this is a stanchion barn and, and pretty much the theory is, is, is all the cows live in here during the day. Like now it's winter, they're out in the sun, scratching around. We got some feed out there and some water out there besides. So maybe a couple hours a day. But, and then in the summer, they will be in here twice a day because we milk twice a day and we'll feed them their grain, their corn silage, and they'll eat in here. So anyway, they get milked in this stall. In a parlor, they would get milk, they would go into the parlor just for milking. They wouldn't eat in there or anything else, which then they're only, each cow is in there maybe 10 minutes, and they go in in groups of six, eight, 10, 12, whatever the size of their parlor is. So anyway, what we got here is a two inch stainless steel line. And even though it looks a little dusty on the outside, now in the warmer months, we pressure wash this all, this all gets polished up. Um, in the winter, it's kind of hard to do because of all the bedding. You don't want to be getting water on everything when it's cold out. So um, you'll have to kind of excuse the few of the little dust in that. But, and then this is what we call a stall cog, um, cog where the top end, now one touches our system and there's different configurations depending on the company, but your milk could go in up here and then down here would be your pulsation. And then these two little pegs here would be your the electricity that activates the pulsation. You got two different si sides. So why one side is not pulsing, the other side is. And we'll kind of explain that with the, with the milk machines. And then the line above, and in this setup, some, some of these, this, this pipe would be down here. But this line up here, is the airline for pulsation. So inside both of these pipes, there's a vacuum of, and ours is exactly 14.3 pounds per square inch of vacuum. And generally milking cows is, it all depends on their setup. It's real close in that, that area. Some are, you know, they're, they're off maybe a half pound one way or the other, depending on, on the setup. So in a conventional or the original pipeline systems, you would have two hoses for your milk machine one would get plugged into the milk line, which would be here, and then this line would be down here. You'd have to plug in another hose to that. So you'd actually plug in two hoses. So you got one of these for every each two cows. So as you go down, so if we got 20 cows tied up on this side, we got at least 10 stall cogs or valves, I guess you could call it. And then we did something different in our barn. Now this system I put in in 99. And before that, we had breaker cups, which was one of the first surge pipeline milk machines. We will show that. We'll show pictures of that in this uh, video. So then down here, this is the end towards uh, closer to the milk house or the front of our barn. So typically what we do is we start on the far end and work our way back towards the milk house. So we got all six of our units and we just keep switching them as the cows keep getting milked out until finally finished, almost finished milk and we're real close to the milk house. So then what I had these my dealer do when we put this in, let's put two stall cogs or valves right here at the end so that it, it, let's say um, we're all finished and we don't we can milk both these cows at the same time so we we get done so that we don't have three or four milkers sitting in the milk house waiting to get washed and we're waiting for cows to get finished we're so you can more str strategically and quicker yeah and i did and after if i had to do it again i would have put it i'd put it even in the in the third and the fourth stall too it, it's again it's because our system is big enough to handle a lot of units because we have a short barn. The longer the barn, the more critical it is to have better vacuum. We got a tighter system, have more slope. So what happens is, so this barn is 80 feet long and a lot of them are a lot longer than that. And it's pretty much gravity. So the far end is maybe, oh, it could be eight to 10 to 12 inches higher. And then right here, this would be the lowest end. 
and again, we got a few cobwebs here, but this all, we, you know, this is all going to get cleaned up in the summer. But this is the lowest end of the pipeline. If you put a transit on this line, right here is the lowest end, and then the opposite corner is the highest end. So everything is gravity. So the milk actually flows down by gravity. So the only thing the vacuum is doing is taking it from the cow and, and, and allowing it to go down into the milk machine and then coming up the hose, the vacuum is pulling it up into the, the line. And there's a lot of science to this. The pulsation, we could get into all kinds of details, but that's generally what happens here. So while dad's getting a milk machine to show pulsation and how that works, uh, like he said, vacuum is a is a huge deal. That uh, that can affect your milk quality and and how well your your cows hold up and and the longevity of them. Because if you're overdoing it with your vacuum, that can essentially wear a cow out, you know, and and lead to health issues or somatic cell count issues. Mid video here, I wanted to remind you guys that uh, you can go check out GearockFarms.com. It's it's a store we run where we sell hats, and in the future here, we're going to be selling other items as well. So stay tuned. Go check us out at GearockFarms.com if you haven't already. If uh, for those of you that have already checked out the site, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Also, remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it. It helps us out a lot and uh, it makes it so that we can keep making these videos for you guys. So we'll get back into the video here, but that's enough for that kind of stuff. Let's get back into the video. We got one of our units we use now and the brands are, they're, they're quite universal. I mean, they, a lot of guys will use a, the, the claw will be a different brand from their valves and different things like that. But, and then inflations, there's dozens of different styles a guy can use. It's all preference and, and how much money you want to spend to get your milk in the tank. So anyway, all the rubber parts on here pretty much get switched out every three months is what we do. We call those in the inflations, but you generally see the idea here. So valve here, the milk will go through this part and then this is your pulsation part. And, you, and that comes in contact here. So when I plug this in, I'm plugging in the airline, airline pulsate and the milk line all in all in one unit versus like he referenced before how in the past you had a claw on the top that plugged in and then you also had another pulsator part of the machine so you had two hoses and uh, two separate parts to plug in yeah so you actually got two you got a milk hose and an air hose and there's there's two hoses together this is what we call double pulsation now my other system this would be the milk hose and this would be the pulsation hose. And this is single pulsation. Now this is the first surge pipeline milk machine. They call these break, surge breaker cups. Extremely heavy, you still had to use a strap to, to hold that under the cow. They do the same thing that does, it's just a little more labor involved, a little heavier. And basically I switched because we couldn't get parts anymore. There was nothing wrong with what this did for, for milking. But you had to physically fumble two hoses, plug one in here and then plug another one in there. And that was kind of the downside of it. And the idea of double pulsation is, is basically what happens here is, and we're set up for side to side. So why this side is pulsing, this side's releasing. And that's where you get that. So it's basically side to side. So your unit will almost be swaying just slightly underneath her. And it splits it up so that the vacuum in your system is very consistent. Cows are extremely sensitive to this. And you want good results. Those, those numbers got to, your, your vacuum is, has to stay as close to 14.3 as possible. So all that does is help split things up. Instead of the old system, everything is surging all at once. All four are getting pulled at the same time. And um, you might get places in your line where one cow can feel it from the other cow getting milked or, and everything isn't is consistent also to add to that it does make a difference how many units you have and things like that like you don't want to bog down your flood your system so my first line like here this is an inch and a half pipe <laughs> when these boys were kids they used to do pull-ups on this actually this is the line that used to be in here when i came here now that's inch and a half this is two inch and i would I would imagine our capacity is more than double there because of that. And there's even three inch lines they get. But once you get too big, cleaning becomes more of an issue. Um, so the longer the barn, the bigger the line needs to be, generally. Or again, like you said, too many units. So we milk with six. 
If you get some really high producing cows and your barn is very long, that way you can't have nearly as much slope from front to back, the milk can't flow as fast, um, you could run into some issues there. That's where a parlor comes in again because it's set up all different, bigger plumbing, and everything is, is designed to flow better and to prevent flooding of your system. Because you got milk, so you can think half that line is full of milk, but then the rest is air, so you gotta balance that. It's very particular about producing quality milk and, and milking a cow out without ruining her, I guess, or wearing her out faster. That's generally how that works. And then of course here, we got a little valve in there. And if you look real close, when this is down, it, it shuts the air off to this hose. So when we're, until we're actually down under her, ready to put these on her, I'll just hold my hand underneath it like that. And then I can put them on and that lets the, lets the vacuum go. And those valves are super handy because they kind of trip. If she were to kick it off, it bumps it off, shuts shuts the system off. Yeah, it will shut off. And then there's this little latch on here. That That's when we have it in the wash vat upside down like this. So all these are in water or in the soap or whatever. We can actually lock them open. Yeah. Otherwise they'd all pop shut by themselves. And you're right, that's what it's designed for. That simple it's, valve system is really handy and it, it prevents us from sucking up any bedding or anything if she were to kick it some off. Some foreign matters, right. And I, then, I remember when dad upgraded to that and that was such a simple thing, but it, it really does make Now the old one had a, just a valve, like a turn, turn valve, valve there, oh. um, which you had to physically do it. So if she kicked it off, you had to rush over there quick to turn it off and reposition it. That's generally how that works. There's a lot more science to that. But. And then up here is the brain of the system. And I only have one with this chunk on here. It's a kind of an expensive add-on. It was way back in, in 99. And, and um, that would tell you the milk yield. Um, and you had them on all six. You would calibrate it. So you'd measure what's in the tank. And you could calibrate it. So if it said 45 pounds, it could be within a pound or two. Um, I only had it on one, so I didn't really get calibrated. And then there would be a beeper on there. So when there's no milk flowing for so many seconds. And that could be, the sensitivity of all that can be set. I got a book on this. And they were a good idea at the time. And frankly, it really doesn't really do anything to make the milk machine milk better. It just tells me stuff. It tells me the time. And and, and uh, how long she was milking and if, you know, and things like that. So you're, you just become more efficient milking, you know? So if I was gonna get somebody new in here to milk with me, they could use that as kind of a reference. It almost tells them, uh, your cow is done. You need to get there and get it off. Cause once, once she's milked out, you're kind of tugging on her. It's almost like trying to get water out of an empty gunny sack. You're just gonna ruin things. So that's generally how that works. Since we're back here, we'll go, We'll show you where the what makes the vacuum. And that's probably one of our more, that's probably the heart of this whole system, the vacuum pump. While we're moving over there, I wanted to ask you guys, when it comes to units and pipelines and things like that, you dairy guys, let us know down in the comments where you would purchase used parts or, or items like that in order to service an older system like this. If any of you know, let us know down in the comments. You know, obviously we work with our dealer and things like that, but I'd be interested to know where you could get parts online or something like that. Where's a good place to buy used milking equipment? Let us know down below. So this would be our vacuum pump room. You could call it the utility room. This is kind of behind our milk house. This is our barn wall. So there's, again, it's, it's an afterthought from what was built originally, but it, it works great. This device right here is basically what creates our vacuum. And we had one with the veins in it originally. And I think this is what some type of blower they call this. This is more of a Cadillac compared to what I used to have in here. And then what you got here is a filter. If it's some milk or some water would get in the system, it doesn't get into the vacuum pump itself. It all protects the vacuum pump because this is the heart of our milk machine. And then here's, uh, this is just an empty PVC tank for vacuum capacity, for instance, so that if we would have two or three valves happen to be open at one time or something like that, that it still has got enough vacuum to keep that 14.3 as consistent as possible. Then up here, this vacuum regulator, they got it so you can actually remove it. There's a little gasket here so that you can clean it. And this little, little dial on top. Now, when my company comes here to do the route, we call it the route where they'd sell me the soaps, uh, any parts or um, like inflations or anything, There's they would do like a routine check. Once a month, they'd come here and plug a, a, a device into my milk 
line and um, make sure my vacuum is still at 14.3 and it might change just slightly sometimes the, the humidity or the you know the time of the year but then occasionally they would clean this and again this is where the air goes in because that device could make your vacuum go through the roof so this allows air to come in and regulates the vacuum to exactly 14.3 and then he'll adjust his dial and that's probably your most important part the consistency yeah, and then this is designed so like when we do our wash, some water might get up into this system, which is okay, because if there's a, a little bit of milk film up in there because of the vacuum sucking it in, it, it's just nature that's going to happen that way. The water will kind of rinse that out and it would come out down here after you shut your system off. So again, it prevents water from getting into the, into the vacuum pump itself. And there's basically, I think we got a five horse motor under there, if I'm not mistaken or three horse or five i'd have to look it doesn't really matter but that that's kind of like the when you when you hear the the big hum when we're milking that's what's making it and back here if this was on right now we you wouldn't be able to hear us it's yeah just, you don't want to hang just, out in this room for no, no it, it's on. it's it is kind of a a noisy place even with the big exhaust system it's still a lot of noise so that's generally how that works so this would be our pulsation control typically this device would be in the milk house and being that our milk house is kind of small and there was really no nice place to put it where the moisture wouldn't ruin it, it, it got put out here. It's real close to the milk house anyway. So this is what does the pulsing. And I'm, I'd have to check again. I don't know if they call it a 6040. One would be the actual pulsing and then the release side. Again, there's a chip you can switch out in here to get what recommended for you or what you want. That's a little bit of a brain of the pulsation of the system. And then you got wiring that comes out of this that would go to all your, your, your stall valves. So it's all electrical. Now the really old systems were what they call pneumatic, which is just air control. That's what we got down in the calf barn in our maternity pen. It's one that's just controlled by air and yeah, they're not and as accurate. Just mechanically bouncing back yeah, and forth. It's yeah. the air that's pushing it. And it's good enough for milking one or two cows or something like that, but they're not, they're sensitive to the dirt and the moisture and some of that. So you had to kind of babysit them a little bit more where this is way more accurate and consistent. That's, that's the key. It doesn't really matter. And then here we have a gauge. Um, and I, th to me, it's just more of a reference when that needle would be on about about that 14 and that way in case I'm wondering if my system is working right I might have trouble with a unit I can run over here quick and look at my gauge and make sure my vacuum is where it belongs and if it ain't some valve was left open or something fell apart or something got stuck somewhere and you got to start brainstorming just fix it and here this long pipe here is what we call our manifold and right now we got we got eight valves on there this is the one I just took out to show you guys but and we'll only milk at six unless i got some real good help around we can milk with eight but again we got to be able to keep up in order to make sense of it because you still got to physically wipe the cows and switch the units fast enough and we can cut our milking time down in half if we got the right kind of help so it's kind of nice to, that we have it and then if one something would go wrong with one we can just let's set it aside and kind of like having more tractors than you need you just grab another one and you're able to still complete the task because this is something that we can't just skip. That's the one thing with the dairy industry. It's like changing diapers. You, you, you can't skip it and you can't milk in the morning for tonight. You know, you, you have to be on a 12 hour, roughly a 12 hour schedule in a sense. So yeah, you got a manifold. Then here we got a, an air bleed. And what this is used for is the wash. And Mason did explain a little bit of that in, in a different video. Yeah. We got to let the air in to push the water through the barn and, and do a better wash. And then, uh, and then of course, our wash bath and stuff here. So we got our jar. There's vacuum in here. And then right down in here, for instance, this bucket full of parts. You know, different replacement parts. Here's them old valves I was talking about. You can kind of see them there. I used to use them, but um, there's just all sorts of different pieces that may break and again to have them on hand i mean you can see those little guys those are my contacts and for the pulsation that's a wear part and maybe they'll maybe last five five years i don't know vary a little bit but that's an important part this little flapper here and this is a surge setup now typically the gaskets you just see that part to put all our plumbing together that's a surge style 
but this one has this little flapper on and that is literally inside right here right in there and here's our milk pump so this pump when this jar fills up to these probes and it comes in contact it trips it it activates this pump to force the milk into the tank through this pipe and into our into our hole here okay and it forces it through the plate cooler we'll talk about that but but this guy will open and then shut there's a little hole there anyway that is a very very important little piece they got to get replaced and i can go several years but with this you cannot milk it out this and it's just a simple little gasket you got to be sure to have these on hand the filter cartridge it goes inside this pipe right here and when mason was explaining the wash he kind of showed some of that and we got a box of filters in here and they come in a box of 100 they call it a sock this gets switched out every milking so i use two of these a day and that's to catch like any straw or anything foreign that would happen to get into the milk which is going to happen so what i got there's one like this and like you know with a filter on it inside this pipe right now we never run anything through this system without that filter in there because we don't want anything foreign to get into our plate cooler for one thing even during the wash in case a piece of straw or whatever gets caught up in there it's it's gonna start causing some some bacteria issues through time and and so really what we do is after we rinse our system we switch out to a new filter so this this cartridge i'll have it sitting right here during the wash it's real handy it's already on there flip out my old one throw that down into the vat to get washed throw my filter out in the garbage and then slide in my new filter so again that's that's the first step of of keeping the milk clean that gets into our tank and then of course you got all that pasteurizing and all that stuff goes on at our co-op so that fills up so this roughly holds about five gallons it trips that this milk pump will push the milk through the plate cooler which got 52 plates in here you got cold well water on one side which is 50 degrees and you got the milk on the other side of all those plates and it's basically going through a huge maze forcing it through Cooling it down to, let's say, I'm gonna say maybe 60 degrees. Milk comes out of a cow 101, 102 degrees. And maybe by the time it gets to the milk house or in the winter, it might be down to 90 degrees. And then uh, goes to the plate cooler, comes into the tank at 60 degrees. And then the tank is like a huge refrigerator, which got a cooling system on it, which takes it down to 38 degrees or 37 or whatever it is. And then this would be our compressor. And if this is virtually the same thing you got inside your refrigerator. It's just a large version of it is what it is. And you, you know, you got your lines which are free on in there and it's hooked to the thermostat. And then on the tank, you got this device is your agitator and that will, it's on a timer and you can actually hear the timer. That, that's, that's a timer. So, and I'm not sure if it's about once every hour or what it's set for, but it'll stir the milk a little bit because it, the cooling plates are on the bottom of the tank. When you're milking, you're putting warmer milk in, it stirs it and it makes sure it blends it all together. And if the temp goes above, I think it kicks on at 41 degrees and it kicks off at 38. That's how ours is set up. So this will run. And actually in the winter, when it's cold like this, this will give off heat. So it's taking the heat from the milk and it's blowing it into this room. So twice a day, this room gets heated up real nice. Maybe gets almost 80 degrees in here for a little while. So it ends up helping that too. And then down here we got all our soaps and, and our acids and our different cleaning supplies and stuff to, to uh, and our teat dips and stuff to, to use here in the milk and milk and cows. So then uh, touch on a little of the history. So that tank hasn't been in here the entire time. When you switched out your pipeline, right? That's when that... Well, it, it, there was different phases. So what we came to this farm in 91, uh, there was a flat top 400 gallon um, Mueller tank. And that was basically only about this tall where you'd open those two big lids and you had to physically clean it by hand um, a after two days of milk. That only held like 3,600 pounds, I believe. 400 gallon it was. And, and that's pretty much what everybody had back in the 70s and the, into the early 80s. Then we, then we ended up with a 600 gallon universal. I must have had that for almost 10 years. And that got a leak in the, in the cooling end of things at the Freon and stuff. So we switched that one out into this 700 gallon Mueller. Now, the trouble is with these, with these old setups is the milk house was not built for just bigger tanks. There's usually not enough room. And then no one's been buying new tanks that small for 
40 years. I mean, so you're getting other tanks where farms have went out of business and buying those and using those to get get yours going. So yeah, this is, uh, I, I think this is the fourth tank that was in the smelt house because uh, I could see where the legs were for the original one. And I would, I'm one of the guests back in the, in the 60s. And my dad, you know, because I grew up in this area, my dad said this farm was, there was only one other farm in this valley that had bulk milk uh, before everybody else. And this was the second one. You know, they put a milk house on. Typically, the milk house was away from the barn. They had a little building someplace, which kind of made sense. Get it away from the yeah. the, the the dirt and the, the cows and stuff. Probably and it, near the well somewhere. Yeah, and then, and then the well water helped cool it and things like that. And then because uh, that was a big switch in the industry, right? Going from having an actual well versus like a sand point or something like that, uh, like for, a cistern. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. For having, like like we showed up here, at that big tank in the ground up on a hill, and then gravity flow, and those got to be kind of a sanitary issue. Yeah, I kind of like the concept because it's almost like a water tower. Yeah. If you want water, that that's uh, kind of appealing that way, but sanitary wise. So really, grade A, grade B, the big difference was is how your water system was set up. They kind of used that that grading system to say, hey, if you want to get more for your milk, we want to be sure your milk's going to be more secure as far as uh, uh, sanitation's concerned. So switch up your well system to something that's more sealed mm -hmm. and modern. There's a huge, huge part of this industry that revolves around preventing contamination. Whether it's antibiotics or some foreign something getting into the water, getting into the cows, getting into the milk, getting into washing. I mean, it, it seems like almost everything we do revolves around producing the most um, wholesome, cleanest product we can. Yeah, I don't think there's any grade B out there anymore. Maybe Amish or something like that, but I think it's kind of fizzled down to where it's just grade A, top quality or nothing. It used to be, I'm not sure how the laws have changed, uh, Grade B milk could not be bottled. It could be used for cheese. Because again, cheese making, there's just a process that would, let's say if there was some sort of bacteria that was higher or something, it probably would, wouldn't would uh, affect the final product, I guess. But bottled milk, that you, it, and then what I remember as a kid growing up, a lot of the farms were grade B because of their wells and stuff. And then the old timers are like, we're not gonna switch our well, we got good water and every farm varied, but. It all went on the same truck. Grade A, grade B went on the same truck, but it only got it all got made into cheese. But the grade A farmers would get maybe another fifty cents to a dollar and a half more. So it was kind of appealing, and you could afford to update your well and things. And it's and like you door. said, eventually everybody just went to that, and it was just a way to encourage you to and not to say that we're not going to take your product anymore, but we want you to make a better product if we can. Yeah, for sure. It was great to kind of walk through the entire milking setup. And as for the comment section, if you guys have any more questions, let us know down below. We might be able to answer them here throughout the winter, especially because we have more time. And then also you dairy guys or retired dairy guys, let us know about the setups you had or any of the upgrades you made over the year, like how it went switching to a parlor or switching to a robot or pros and cons that way. I'd be interested to know what your guys' opinion are and what setup was, was the best. Yeah, because uh, it's always a fear to switch something like this because you can't just switch it back. Like a piece of farm machinery, you can just trade it back to a, some different style or company or something. Something like this, it's it's a process of putting it in. And uh, you like I said, it, you got 12 hours to do your switch in a sense. Yeah, or even to sell it. There's not a big market where you can just ship it off to the other guy. Or So when I grew up, I grew up with the buckets, uh, the surge bucket, and then... Uh, we had the step saver for a while. I remember carrying milk when I was really small, and then uh, the step saver um, was kind of like a makeshift pipeline uh, with a with pretty much a hose that that linked into your barn, so you didn't actually have to carry it from the barn to the milk house. And then, uh, of course, the pipelines, the inch and a half, and it went to the two inch, and then of course the parlor setups and everything. And a lot of that stuff kind of went that direction because of size. You know, so once you went past 30, 40 cows, you needed something more, you know, that, that's a lot of weight. Less, less and, labor intensive. Yeah, and, and the bigger you got, the more you needed to, and that's even where I always said, like, the parlor kind of got really popular. You go past 60 cows, that gets, gets to be quite the labor in a, making that type of system work. It was a nice, solid video. Make sure to leave plenty of comments down below. Let us know what else you'd like to see. We'd love to read the comments and, and maybe answer some questions. So thank you all for sticking to the end. 
thanks to dad for i definitely learned something today hopefully you guys learned something too and uh i mean i i the, i have trouble sometimes with the terms like my pulsation rate I, I mean i had this all in my head at one time but we haven't done any real changes on it for so long that i would almost have to dig back through the paperwork or I, I call my guy that put it in which he's retired now so he probably doesn't want to mess with it or remember even but i know it's it can be like a lot of things it'd be like me in a big city i'd be lost i'd be like well i don't know how this works yeah. uh, but here it's all the common sense to us yeah so thank you all for watching thanks for dad for helping us out with this video and uh we will uh see you guys next time